Lord, you dream that you know you dream that you must be born again. He said, Surely I cannot enter my mother's womb a second time. And then he hears these words: Flesh gives birth to flesh, spirit gives birth to spirit. And so, when I received the forgiveness that God provided through His Son Jesus, man, my eyes were awakened, and I started thinking much, you know, on a regular basis about the Lord Jesus. I started thinking about what he did to make my new life in Christ possible. And so it, my friend that once was, a, you know, somewhat of an influence on me, uh, he, he dwindled as far as that testimony. It wasn't like it once was. And as the years went on, one thing that he had pretty solid is he would say, to his friends and whosoever that would hear, he'd say, boy, if you miss heaven, you've missed everything. If you miss heaven, you've missed everything. I think we all would say, give a hearty amen to that. Amen? And so when I actually preached his funeral, and, uh, and in that funeral I talked to his friends that were, many of them were uh, my friends when we were growing up. And... Uh, and, and I put that on his little funeral card. I put on there uh, for him, if you miss heaven, you missed everything, in hopes that when I speak to these people in this funeral that they're going to get a hold of that he has a secure place in heaven because of what Jesus did, not because of who he was, per se, or the things that he has done. And so heaven's a very important, a very important reality. Amen. So we can say that, yeah. Well, I've got a, uh, actually my message tonight, I usually don't have titles if you notice. I don't have little catchy things that uh, I just preach the word and let God do what he does. Amen? All right. Well, tonight I actually have a, I have a little catchy little uh, message title. It's called Heaven, Ye- Heaven Yes, Hell No. So preacher, you just said it. I absolutely did. Heaven, yes, hell, no. And, and you know what? My brother, my brother, um, he came to know the Lord after I did my, he's just a, just a little bit older than I am. And uh, back in the 90s, they had all sorts of these crusades that um, you could go take people to, and they could hear the gospel message in a very refined uh, way that they could get their mind wrapped around by evangelists that were, Willie Palau was one of them. And I love listening to this guy. He had a burden for the Lord, and he really, he was a great speaker. So we went to this big arena. It was Back in the day, it was called the Rosemont Horizon. We go to this arena, and uh, it was called Say Yes Chicago. And during that crusade, I came in there. I was in the, like the mezzanine area looking out at this arena, and the people that were in the entirety of the Rosemont Horizon would have fit in this sanctuary. And I remember saying to my brother, I remember saying, what is the church? And I was a new believer. Listen, I, was in a, a, I, I received the Lord, and, and uh, 30 days later, I'm in this Say Yes Chicago campaign, just excited about trying to lead somebody else to what I have just found, right? And so when I look out at this arena, I said, what are these people... What are these people thinking? Are they saying the hell with everybody? And my brother got all tight because I said this word once again, hell. And I said, listen, they're not going to heck. You hear what I'm telling you? Hell is a reality, but so is heaven. Heaven is a reality, and it's a wonderful place that God has reserved for those who have received his son Jesus as the payment of, you know, the Bible says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And uh, for those who would call on his name, that they would have this place in heaven. And that's certainly a wonderful thing. Amen? Well, before I get carried away too much, I'm going to talk a little bit about heaven as we get started. But I have a little video clip that I want you to consider uh, just to open your eyes, just to get the stage set, um, to get your thinking moving in the right direction. Amen? Amen? Guys, if you put that video up.
That's pretty sobering, amen? You guys are quiet. They actually cut it off just a second earlier. At the end it says, P.S., wish you were here. Imagine this place called hell. You know, when you look at that, it's a very dramatic video, isn't it? You understand? Everything described therein is in the scriptures. And so, when you think about that, praise God for Jesus, amen? That he, he made a way that we don't have to end up in that place called hell. Powerful stuff. When I consider that video, I, you know, that was something I'd seen years ago. It had a profound impact on me. Because I, I really, really feel that way. I feel like I want to communicate with you know, very graphic color, the message that God has given us about what he's provided for us in heaven in order that no one would have to go to that place called hell. Amen? The Bible says God that he wishes none to perish, not one, but all come to repentance. Amen? Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 says this, but our citizenship is in heaven as we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? So if you know the Lord Jesus as Savior, then I want to hear a hearty amen. All right, amen. All right, Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 and 20 says this, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal, but store up yourself treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Amen? Well, you know, you hear me this whole theme of changing our mindset, it's not a financial thing. But it's about a conviction that's driven by the realities of the gospel message. Amen? We're driven by the reality of the gospel message. That God has made a way that no one, no one would have to be tormented in a place called hell. Praise God. Revelation chapter 21 Verse 1 through 5 says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of the heavens from God, prepared as a bride beautiful dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place, God's dwelling place, now among the people, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and he will be, and there will be no more death, no more mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things have passed away. He who has, was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Well, that's pretty sobering, isn't it? Amen? Let's go down on the same chapter. Revelation 21, verse 21 through 25 says, The twelve gates were, were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. In the, great, in the great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. I did not see the temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Amen. The city does not need the sun nor the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light. Amen. And the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it on on no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no nights there. Amen? You start thinking about roads that are what we would call precious jewels, are the streets of heaven, and that the light that's there that's illuminating is God himself and Jesus the Lamb. Amen? So illuminating. They were looking intently, as Acts chapter 1, verse 10 and 11 says, they were looking at intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. 
And a Galilee said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? That same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And that's getting sobering because that Jesus who came from heaven, all right, that Jesus who came from heaven to be born of a virgin in a manger, right? He left that place in heaven to be born of a virgin in a manger, to be Emmanuel, God with us, to die on a cross. He ascended back to heaven, right? And that's where he's at, and he comes back for his church, right? Anybody that's called upon his name, right? Acts chapter 4, verse 12 says this, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which they must be saved. Amen? What do you think about that? God has made a way, and it's through the Son, Jesus, right? I'm compelled to tell people about Christ. Amen? I am absolutely compelled to share my faith with people because I know who I was and I know who I am today, but also because there is a reality that God is just, and one day we stand before him. And either we pay the debt ourselves, which means that's a debt we cannot pay, which means there's a a place called hell awaiting, or or there's the payment in full by the Lord Jesus. Um, on a tombstone, a man had these words written. said, Consider, young man, as you walk by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, you soon shall be. So prepare, young man, to follow me. Sounds pretty good, pretty profound, but someone took a knife and they scratched this as a response to the tombstone that they had read. To follow you is not my intent until I know which way you went. Amen? Wow. Huge stuff. You know, honestly, so many times when I do funerals, people get really uptight. They get really uptight because I always preach the gospel. I always talk about Jesus and, and how important it is for us to receive what he has done for us as the payment of our sin. It's so critically important. And people try to, they try to run away from it. At one funeral that I was preaching, the mother of this young lady was sitting in the front row. They, they, they called on me to do the service, and, and if you know who I am, you, you're going to have to understand what you're going to get. And so I'm in there, and I'm preaching this message, and, and finally Ma's had enough of it. And she starts thanking me for my efforts. Well, you can keep thanking me, but we're not done here. Because, listen, the truth is the truth, and if we understand the magnitude of that message, if somebody's a little bit upset with me because they don't like what they're hearing, what about the person who receives what God is offering? I've got a passage for us to consider here tonight. It's found in Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 1 through 8. You know, you know and incidentally, just before I get going on that, that how God does amazing things for us because he gives us examples to look at. In Ezekiel chapter 33, uh, the, t- the title in my Bible actually says this, Renewal of Ezekiel's Call as Watchman. Right? you to listen, though, and consider what you hear. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, speak to your people and say to them, when I bring the sword against the land and the people of the land choose one of their men and make him their watchman, and he sees the sword coming against the land and blows the trumpet to warn the people, then if anyone hears the trumpet but does not heed to the warning and the sword comes and takes their life, 
their blood will be on their own head, since they heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not heed to the warning. Their blood will be on their own head. If they had heeded the warning, they would have saved themselves. But if, they, if the watchman sees the sword coming, it does not blow the trumpet to warn the people, and the sword comes and takes someone's life, that, the per- that person's life will be taken because of their sin. But I will hold the watchman accountable for their blood. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the people of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you wicked person, you will surely die. And you do not speak out to, you do not speak out to dissuade them from their ways. That wicked person will die for their sins. And I will hold you accountable for their blood. You know, when I think in terms of that analogy, watchmen, and you can understand what that would be, if there was a, a watchman and there was soldiers coming that were going to try to take a fortress, and the watchman would sound the trumpet, and anybody sleeping would jump to, to their feet, and they would become aware and alert that there's an opposing threat to them, and they would begin to be ready for battle. Amen? It would be a fool that would lay in their bed after such a warning. Amen? Well, I'll tell you what. You know, we've, we've become so calloused, I think, uh, with warnings. You're driving in traffic and you see men working signs. You know, when I used to work for the city and, and I had to do traffic control, I was a flagger. And they send you. They send you to school for that. Believe it or not, you're supposed to be. You're supposed to take the most intimidating people you have on the crew and put them out there as a flagger. And you are the last line of defense between a motorist and your work, your your crew, right? And so, what would it be if the flagger is what you see all the time on the roadway? You see flaggers on their telephone. You ever see that? You drive by and the person that's got the sign is on their telephone. Yeah and they're not doing their job. And you know what we were instructed when we were in uh, class for that, being certified to be a flagger. They told us, you're the last line of defense if a motorist is coming through and, and they seem like they're daydreaming or something like this, and they pass your work zone and do not yield, hit the car with the, with the sign. Do whatever it takes to alert them, because sometimes people just space out and, And you may have to, you're the last line of defense, so you're the watchman. So you you can't leave your crew vulnerable. You you, you have to protect them. In in whatever measure that would be, you'll have to figure that out based on the severity of it. But the most important thing is you don't don't neglect your post. You're there to do a job. And so to understand what that looks like, how many of you have driven through a construction zone that says men working, there ain't anybody out there working, right? It's another thing they taught us. They said when you're in a work zone and you're going to go to lunch, take all your signage and drop them face down in the lawn. Because the reason people don't yield to the signs is they become numb to the signs, right? They say, there ain't nobody out. I've been through here all week. There's not been one person out there. And the next thing you know, they go out there and they run someone over because the crew is back and they're working. And so we become numb to it, right? Another thing that we find ourselves in those kind of circumstances are tornado warnings, right? We have them sirens that go off. Yeah. So they got them sirens. And old Don back there, he knows that that there are things called tornadoes that try to come by and say hello to you. Amen? They'll make make, uh, your day ruined. And when that siren goes off, you best he do it. But my point is to say is the church is supposed to be the voice that's the watchman with the gospel message to a lost world. They're supposed to consider how we would communicate that message with some sort of urgency, amen? But the church sometimes feels lethargic. You know, the scriptures tell us to, to set our minds on things above, Right? We're supposed to consider heaven and, and God and in his order in heaven. 
And so many times that we lose sight of it, we get all wrapped up in the things that occupy our day, and we forget the very reason we're here, right? William Booth, the foundation of the Salvation Army, was told by an atheist, if I believed what you Christians say you believe about a coming judgment that impendent rejectors of Christ would be lost, I would crawl on my bare knees on crushed glass all over London, warning men night and day to repent of their sins and turn to Christ, who is their only place of refuge. Boy, those must have been sobering words to hear. You imagine somebody that says, I, I don't believe in this God. And there's plenty of people that struggle with that in this world, right? I don't believe in this God, but if I did, and hell is real, as the scriptures say, I would crawl all over London on my knees on broken glass day and night to warn people of that judgment and that there's a way to escape it because Jesus paid for it. Amen? Should make us a difference, make a difference in our life. And so a lot of times, for me, a lot of the scriptures that I'm using here tonight that I'm talking about, I use them in funerals. I use them in funerals a lot, and I love doing a funeral of somebody that I know is called upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Amen? Because there's a, there's a wonderful celebration. Amen? All right, so we're going to look at Luke's Gospel, chapter 16. I just wanted you to get a hold of this thought as we go on here. Luke chapter 16, verse 19 and following says, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, who lived in luxury every day. And at his gate lay a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, and longing to eat what fell on the rich man from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came that the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. And the rich man also died and was buried and in Hades, or hell, where he was tormented. He looked and he saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip, his, dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us, and between us and you is a great chasm that has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family. I have five brothers. Let them warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. And Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. And he said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if somebody rises from the dead. Amen? Well, you know, of course he's referring, he's referring to when Jesus rose, nobody believed him either, did they? They didn't respond to somebody that did rise from the dead. The Messiah who paid the penalty of all our sins, they didn't believe that. I want to draw your attention to something, though. You know, I've really been, I get in these crazy, deep, deep meditation thoughts about particular topics. And I, and I try to consider, you know, what is our role in the grand scheme of things, in the big picture? What does God really want us to embrace with our lives? And you know, I think in this scripture where you have this plea that says, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them 
so they will not also come to this place of torment. There you have it, something really serious. And I just want to camp out on that for a little bit. I'll come down on the floor for a minute. For you to consider this persuasive request. You imagine, you know, once it's too late, it's too late. Amen? You've heard that, right? The time to bend a knee to Christ is here, this side of the grave. In other words, we call upon him as Savior. We receive forgiveness of our sin. We receive redemption. We receive what it is to be born again. And as a result, that ought to transform us. Amen? Should transform us. There should be this huge, huge change in the way we perceive things. When I think in terms of an atheist that would say, that would say, if I believe what you believe, I would crawl all over London on broken glass day and night to proclaim the message. So when I think about us, the first thing that comes to mind is church. If you know the Lord Jesus as Savior, that to what extent would we go to blow the trumpet for a lost world? Amen? To what extent would we go? What hinders us from being that person? What hinders us from being that person? Well, I'll tell you what, when people pass, I've heard so many different things. I've heard, you know, all the woulda, shoulda, couldas of everything that you cannot change. People try to rehearse different things they would say and do that would be different and all these things. And what I would say, it's really crazy because we need to contemplate things in the here and now, right? So many times I've done memorial services right here on this platform or funerals. And there's been times we, I, I like to do open mics with people. I like to send a microphone out and we're going to just hear people share memories as we celebrate the life of somebody. And every time we have one of those services, inevitably, you know what I hear? Bone-chilling words of people that say this, after they say this wonderful thing or whatever, how much the person meant and all these things, they say this, I wish I would have told them that. Right? I wish I would have told them that. What a tragedy. Amen? I mean, if you consider, if you consider what that would be, if you have something in your heart you really want to share, then, then say it now. Do it now. And so when we consider what it is to love somebody, we know that what the Scripture tells us <clears throat> that... God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's a love like none other. And so if we love like Christ, guess what we're going to do? We're going to tell them the answer to a problem that they have. Is that you're ill-equipped to meet God face to face without Jesus. Amen? You're ill-equipped. And so the answer to it is to receive what Jesus paid for already. But when we do, where is the compelled to share our faith that changes lives of other people? Did you hear what I'm telling you? It's not like this passive, you know, attitude that we have. A passive attitude that says, you know, I'm going to tell somebody about Christ if, if they'll listen to me. If they'll listen to me. Well, I was going to tell you, when you consider how important it is to communicate the message of the cross, to compel somebody, to compel somebody, we do that with our lives when we plead with somebody to say, I understand the cost of this. You may not want to have a friendship with me ever again. You may walk away and say, this person's an idiot, a Jesus freak, whatever. 
But at the end of the day, that's a price I'm willing to pay for you to hear this message and consider it. Because the truth of it is, is when people, they have to weigh that out, they have to say, why would this person risk this relationship with this message other than it's critically important, right? It's critically important. And so to what extent would you go to share that and with what kind of passion would you display through your life if we really believed that every person on planet Earth will stand before their maker one day. Amen? We, I think we all believe that, right? So and if we could consider you know, the bigger picture, the Bible says, you know, first there's, we, we have death and then, then the judgment. And we stand before our creator either with a debt that's been paid for or we stand before him with a debt that must be paid. And that debt is an eternal debt. That debt is the wages of sin is death, eternal death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? So you get this picture of being compelled to have a message that's so compelling that I'm going to risk relationships or friendships to tell somebody, you must have this. You don't want to leave earth without Jesus. Amen? You know, there's a lot of, of uh, very catchy tombstones in the cemetery. And as a pastor, I spend time in the cemetery. You hear what I'm telling you? I end up and do graveside service. You know, I, inevitably you end up, a lot of times I'm out at Abraham Lincoln or, or whatever, but the smaller cemeteries, there's some very interesting headstones. There's people that are probably forgotten for years and years and years. You know, but on those headstones, there's some pretty interesting things. And some people think that they know the answers, and, and they'll have a statement that's there on the ground. And they now know, they now know something very different than what's on that stone, right? One headstone once said this. It said, it was from an atheist, and it said, I am all dressed up with nowhere to go, right? Well, let me just tell you, for that person, that dressed up was overdressed for what they're going to need. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Because you do have, you're going to spend eternity somewhere. That's, that's just the gospel truth. And so for us to consider this picture of hell and what it is, should it not compel us? Should it not compel us? So shouldn't there be something inside of us that is so driven to communicate the answer to somebody's problem, right? So we weigh into it a, a risk factor. We look at things and consider, well, this person is not ready to hear this. I, I hear that all the time that people say, well, this person's not ready for this, right? It's like, are they ready to meet the Lord without the message? Because what I would challenge your hearts to consider is, we're responsible to blow the trumpet. We're responsible to, to pass this message to people that desperately need the message. And so there you have it, a very interesting, interesting reality. Heaven is very real. Hell is very real. And guess what? Nobody has to go to hell. Amen? They don't have to go there. So, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. He will punch it, punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. It's so interesting to hear those words. They're so sobering. It says they'll be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord. Because you know what the, the craziest part of this whole thing is? When you think the words that are, are so vivid and clear in the gospel message that says what is eternal life, 
eternal life is to know the one true God in Jesus Christ in whom he sent. Amen? It's an intimate relationship spent in eternity with the one true God in Jesus Christ in whom he sent. So what is the polar opposite of that is that you'll be punished and you'll, if you don't know that God, right? And you don't obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, are you going to blow that trumpet? Are you going to go out and spread the gospel message? And people say, well, preacher, you don't know the people that I deal with. You know, I work with a bunch of heathens. You know, and the circle of people around me, they don't want to hear nothing to do with this. Well, I would say, you know, to what extent do we go to rescue somebody from themselves under a lot of different scenarios? You know, under a lot of different scenarios. What one of us would let a loved one get into a vehicle when you look down at the ground by one of the tires and you see brake fluid all over the ground? And you realize that they got either a you know, wheel cylinder or, or a brake line or something has been breached and you know you know when that hydraulic fluid gets low enough, when they go to hit that brake and call for those brakes, they will not, they will not respond. What extent do you go to stop that car? What extent would you go? I mean, would you put your, body, your physical body in front of a loved one and say, you're not leaving this place, right? You cannot go. Well, you don't understand. I've been waiting for this doctor's appointment for months and months and months. It's like, listen, you cannot go. Listen, take my car. Do whatever. Let's call you an Uber. Let's do You cannot drive this vehicle. Because if you do, your demise is certain. To what extent will we stop them? That's a car in the here and now. What will we do to stop something that we, we have the ability to stop because Jesus already paid for it, right? It's like, well, you don't understand the ridicule that I'll receive in my family and in my friends, all these people that think I'm a whack job, I'm a nutcase. Well, that's certainly possible. It's certainly possible. But Matthew chapter 10, verse 28 says this, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Do you ever consider that? I mean, do you ever put any real thought of how real hell is and the blessings of how real heaven is that God has allowed us to be part of, to partake in? John chapter 14, verse 2 through 4 says this, My father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I am, but I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place that I'm going. Oh, we know that famous scripture. We, are, well, we don't know where you're going. We don't know where you're going, so how can we go there? And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way. I am the way. How many of you believe that Jesus is the way? All right, three or four of you? Hmm? Let me ask it again. How many of you believe that Jesus is the way? All right, so when I think about compelling somebody, you know, there's, there's all different schools of thought with this message, and I tend to lean the polar opposite of a lot of other preachers. And the reason I do is I, I don't believe I can motivate you to action, you know, because I view myself a particular way, so now I'm going to get excited and just do the things God's can put, called me to do. You know why? Because I'm a selfish oof. That's why. So what, what motivates me is the reality of what I've been rescued from. And then... I use that message to compel others to say, you don't have to go down those roads anymore. You, you may think you're a misfit. There's no place for you. But the God of all creation sees it different. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen? And so to receive what Jesus did on that cross and to genuinely, genuinely receive it means I have to receive it in its entirety. That it's Jesus and nothing else that pays for my redemption. And when I realize that and I find myself 
with a brand new identity and I'm born again. That I'm born in the Spirit. I'm alive in Christ. That I am compelled to share a message because the one, the Scripture says, to whom much is given as much is required. That when I realize that I've been put in place as the watchman to blow the trumpet for those who don't know the Lord Jesus, that he says, now don't just blow a trumpet, you know, in some kind of, you know, ridiculous way. Blow it with enthusiasm, with persuasion, with conviction that says, you need to wake up and hear this message. Right? Don't blow the trumpet like like some of these people I see on cops, you know, with a DUI road stop, and the, the cop brings the little thing out, they're supposed to blow in it. Last night in the middle of the night, I seen the craziest one of them I've ever seen in all the times I've witnessed it. The lady was trying to suck in backwards. She didn't want it to read anything that was going on, amen? So if you can imagine blowing the trumpet, what kind of conviction would that sound like if perhaps it was a trumpet? Could you muster up enough lung air to make a sound that would alert anyone? Or would we be so occupied with the things of our life that we're not compelled to do anything? And we don't have we haven't spent any time considering the magnitude of, of the cost of our redemption and how far short of that identity we fell on our own behalf. So when I consider those things, I'm compelled. I'm compelled with a message that says there is no way in all of creation that I would be qualified to enter heaven. But God made a way. In the contrast to that, for those who wouldn't hear that message, there is a place is real. It's it's more real than the, the world we live in in this dimension, this temporal world right now. It's a lake of fire. And it has a horrific, horrific consequence for those who would end up there. Because we've all heard it, haven't we? You know, I want to go there because that's where all my friends are going to be, right? I want to go to that place because they think that they're going to have this big bash. It's like, you know, they, they've got, you know, the, the, the entrance to hell. They think it's like Las Vegas Strip. Right? And you're just going to enter into this place and it's going to be this wonderful thing. And when they get there, they find out that they're the charcoals at the barbecue. And there's no party going on, folks. You hear what I'm telling you? And so you have to ask yourself a question. Do you believe that God of heaven sent his son to die on a cross for your sins? Would you understand what he saved them from, what he saved you from? Do you understand the reason that the God of all creation, you know, you look at the Old Testament, you see how it plays out, the Ten Commandments, the law, everything therein was designed so that a human being could look at that law and see how far short they fall of perfection before Almighty God. And before the foundations of the earth, he made a plan that his son was going to pay the penalty of our sin. And that was going to happen on a wicked Roman cross with, with agony like you could never imagine. And that the love of the Father was seen displayed through the blood of the Son. That whoever would call upon His name would be redeemed. And that's to be redeemed from what? From this place called hell. In the message of the cross, we ought to be compelled deeply because that's a reality. And if you've called upon Jesus, there ought to be something inside of you that says, thank you, God. If there's ever been a time that you wake up and you realize that deep inside that God is doing something in your life and that it's not of yourself, that the convictions that you have in your heart are not driven by your own desires. To the contrary of that, it's by the grace of God that we accomplish His things that He calls us to. And then when I realize that and I contemplate and I realize that, God, You've given me this new identity. You've empowered me to be this guy in the, the, what the, the stock that's on the table, the, the, the prize that is on the table, is that Jesus receives the rewards of His suffering in the life of some poor soul that I need to persuade 
with a message of love they'd never heard before. But we have to consider how do we persuade these people? If we're lethargic, it's like, listen, I'm not kidding you. Brother Dave used to tell me at the when we were at Living Stones at the, the biker church when I was preaching out of Living Stones, and he'd, he used to say, you know, there's a $20 bill if you put another scuff in that pulpit. Because I'd kick the pulpit. I had many toenails come off of me. Because my, my heart would be so heavy. I'd be speaking to people, and it's like, are you guys awake? Do you hear this message? Is somebody going to be compelled with your life? Are they going to say, oh God, I believe that they believe. If I don't believe it, I believe they believe it with every fiber of their being because that is a persuasive, a persuasive argument. And for us to embrace that message of the cross with our lives, we then become compelled to take that message to some poor person who doesn't know the love of Almighty God. And and there might be some rejection in your life with that. They might say, get away from me. You don't understand. I don't need any any of that Jesus stuff. That's good for you, but not for me. And And so for me, it doesn't end there. The message doesn't end there with people. You're going to have to tell me to shut up and never talk to you again, and you still might get stuck with me. Because if the circumstances allow, I'm going to make a plea again, because at some point and some time, you're going to take your last breath. That's reality, folks. And reality is the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? So being compelled, if we consider, how can I be compelled that somebody would be compelled because of what they see in my life? How do I do that? Well, the first thing is come to terms that We all need a Savior, every one of us. You might say, well, I'm not as bad as the next guy. Well, that's not not the issue. I mean, there's not a a big, you know, dry erase board up in heaven, and they go, well, let me just look at this. I can see that, you know, Penny's not nearly as bad as Drew. So, you know, wink, wink, sneak your way in the back door. I'll leave the key unlocked, right? The door is unlocked. It doesn't work like that. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So when we consider it, the first thing we have to understand is, you know, to compel somebody, they have to understand how desperately they need Christ. They have to believe it, that they need Christ. And so any one of us that would examine the recesses of our own our own heart, we would be able to confirm that with somebody, couldn't we? We'd say, boy, there's things going on in my heart I don't want anybody to know about. Certainly want want them on the big screens behind me, being displayed as a movie. And God's answer to that is that he sent Jesus to pay for it. Then he says, now get your mind wrapped around this. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Get your mind wrapped around that. And then consider, as you're on this faith journey, what does it look like to bring somebody with you to hear a message like you're hearing tonight? What does it take to have an influence in somebody's life because you're compelled to share that truth? Amen? What does it look like to consider some of the things we don't want to consider? What does it look like to have an influence on somebody with your very life? I always give an invitation. You know that if you've been here before, you know that I give an invitation. Invitation is just simply an opportunity to, for you to respond to what you're hearing. You might say, well, preacher, I already asked the Lord Jesus to save me. Well, then the question would be that I'd have for you tonight is, are you compelled to share that message with others? Are you compelled to share that message with others? Because if you're not, you probably got something that's caused you to be lethargic. And maybe you just come up and say, you know what, I want to just ask the Lord. I just want to ask the Lord to help me identify that and get that out of my life. But maybe maybe you never asked the Lord Jesus to save you. Maybe you're just banking on, man, I just hope that, you know, I've done more good things than bad things and I'm just going to bank on my understanding of God versus what the Scripture teaches us. That's not a good idea. It's not a good idea. Wherever you find yourself as the music plays, would you respond? 
counselors, would you come up?